Hey viewers, my name is Kara. I'm your host for Tuesdays here on The Pagan Perspective. And this week we are talking about familiars versus our non-human animal family that may live with us, or some people call them pets. This topic, this iteration of this topic, came from Revolution 724, Who Asked? And the text will be in the description as always. Who asked, have you covered familiars? Do you have a familiar? What does that mean? How do you know if an animal companion is a familiar or is familiar material? And also one of the remaining subjects that one of our team members had given us a couple years ago when I asked the team for topics from within our team, what do we want to talk about? What do we want to ask each other? One of the leftover topics that we haven't gotten to yet is what is the role of your pets, if any, in your practice? So the short moniker that I've given to this week is familiars versus pets, or as I prefer to call them, our non-human animal family. Or you might call them animal companions, any uh, type of things like that. You know, people have different preferences because people truly do think of them and treat them in very, very different ways. And the amount of significance and the amount of importance that they have in each person's family and in each person's household greatly differs depending on how those people think of non-human animals, essentially, a lot of the time, or how you think of family. So anyway, you will hear me refer to them different ways in this video. The first question is, have we covered familiars on Pagan Perspective? Yes, we have. The last time I think we really touched on this topic in any kind of specific way, <laughs> that is not as something sort of tangently related to a similar topic, was six years ago. So this is another topic that's kind of coming around. And... It looks like, when I did a little search on the channel, it looks like we also had the subs at the time cover it nine years ago. So really close to the beginning of the collab, it looks like we, like probably when we first had substitute hosts, we had them talk about it. And then six years ago, we talked about a variety of topics, including familiars, spirit guides, animal spirits, stuff like that that we're all kind of related. So that's the first question. Yes, we have covered this topic before. You can use the search function um, on our uploads. If you're on a desktop computer, you can go to our main channel page, the Pagan Perspective channel page on YouTube, and there's a little search bar where you can search just our channel's uploads and you can look for keywords such as familiar. On mobile, I have noticed you can't find that channel specific search bar. So you kind of have to just type in pagan perspective familiars. And that's how I found the ones that we had done before just now using my phone. Anyway, second question. Do you have a familiar follow up? What does that mean? I do not have a familiar. I do not consider myself really to have ever had a familiar but this greatly depends on how you personally define familiars and what usage of the term you believe is correct. I am very generally speaking, you all know this from watching my videos for years, if you have in fact been watching my videos for years. If you're new, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. And if you've been here for a long time, thank you so much for still being here and sticking around and supporting us and me. You will know, if you have heard me talk about this kind of thing before, that I am generally a fan of looking up original definitions and in most cases trying to stick to original definitions if there is one. Language changes, we use words in different ways, and that's why you have us today in 2019 identifying as pagans and identifying as witches, even though those words originally had very negative connotations and were not very nice things. So yes, there are definitely instances in which we reclaim words and terms. Other times, 
I like to look at the original definitions and usages of things to get an idea of what they meant. And that helps to understand how differently people may be using it now. So I have some links in the description here for you to the Wikipedia page about familiars and also an article written by Patty Wigington, fellow Ohio witch, whose articles I have been reading since I was a total beginner baby witch. Didn't even realize she was from Ohio at the time. And when I found that out and met her at a Pagan Pride event in my state, I was like, what? This is crazy. It was like absolutely like meeting a celebrity, like because I had just read so many of her articles about paganism and witchcraft for like forever, my whole path. So Patty, I love you. Um, I will link to an article that Patty has written on the subject as well. But I also have a stack of books here next to me that talk about it. And I'll I'll just reference those really quickly so that you know, but they're all basically encyclopedias that I have. So the sort of original or historical usage of the word familiar is that it is a spirit that helps a witch or a practitioner of magic that helps them, that guides them, that protects them. It is a spirit that very often, but not always, takes the form of an animal. And depending on the source that you're looking at, depending on the time in history and the context, you might see it defined as a demon that takes the form of an animal. And one argument for that is that, of course, those histories were written by people who were very afraid of witches and for whom witchcraft was an evil thing. And so when you look at the history of like the European witch craze and the witch hunts in Europe, you will see descriptions of witches familiars as being demons that take the form of animals that help the witch and do their bidding. There's also one of these sources I looked at here, so I'll show you real quick now. I have, um, there's a little bit on it in the Encyclopedia of Wicca and Witchcraft by the late great Raven Grimasi, who just recently passed away this year, passed to the other side of the veil. So there's a little bit unfamiliar in this encyclopedia. And this one's more of a positive look at it, saying that really the concept of them as demons and the concept of them as evil is really a Christianized idea and that really doesn't have anything to do with it. Of course, today you will also meet witches who talk about um, their practice being really close to that historical European idea and that they do work with demonology and things like that. So you will come across people who will say, no, that is accurate. So it always depends on who you're talking to. So Raven Grimasi writes here, it's a familiar spirit is a concept connected with witchcraft for many centuries. During the Middle Ages and Renaissance period, the church taught that the familiar was an agent of the Christian devil. Um, the oldest concept of the witch's familiar was an animal spirit of nature. The group consciousness of a specific type of animal delimited into a single form. This is actually, this mention in the Raven Gramasi encyclopedia, th that's the only source that I found um, just briefly looking online and in all of my encyclopedias that mention familiars. It's the only one that talks about this usage of the term, this idea that it's, it's like how I talk about um, when I work with the spirits of nature, you might have, for example, there is a particular willow tree in my life that has been a physical location where I have gone to attune with the overall spirit of willow, which is connected to every and any willow ever delimited into that specific physical tree using the term that Gravasi uses here. So that is one usage of it. I have never considered that type of thing to be a familiar. I consider that a related but not exactly the same topic in my mind. So that's more what Raven was talking about here, um, saying that in some cultures this is called a power animal or animal guide. Some witches used a pet animal as the doorway or link to this type of connection to the higher animal spirit. In such cases, the astral form of the animal becomes the vehicle for working with the greater consciousness, although 
whatever. Okay, and then that goes into talking about the peasant class in medieval Europe. Um, but so in that regard, that would be like saying that my cat, who lives with me, a physical being, that I connect to the overall spirit of cat energy through her as an individual. So that would be uh, what this is talking about. The other sources here, they talk about many different things. I also pulled out Raymond Buckland, also the late great Raymond Buckland's The Spirit Book, because I thought something about familiars might be in here, but there actually isn't. Um, familiar is not an entry in this encyclopedia. This is also an encyclopedia. But it does talk about nature spirits, which is somewhat related. And so I'll just read a little bit of this. Um, nature spirits. This is the spirit book, the encyclopedia of clairvoyance, channeling, and spirit communication by Raymond Buckland. This was my mom's book. I have not read through this entire thing. Not that I usually just sit and read through encyclopedias cover to cover, but these other ones that I'm showing you I've looked through far more extensively. This one I really haven't. Nature spirits. According to Carl Jung, nature spirits, spirits, excuse me, I can talk, According to Carl Jung, nature spirits were an early stage of human evolution. They have been termed deva, fairies, angels, undines, water spirits, sylvans, woodland spirits, pixies, and gnomes, earth spirits. Many gardeners believe that on occasion they see nature spirits among the flowers and vegetables. And then it goes on to list um, people who have had specific instances of working with nature spirits to improve the land. That is also something that is part of my practice, working with the spirits of the land. And I've already mentioned like the spirits of trees, things like that. So I definitely work with spirits in that regard where like it's not just um, the spirit of someone who has passed away kind of spirit, but it's the overall kind of energetic signature of a thing, um, you might say an archetype, such as the spirit of willow being represented by all individual willow trees, um, cat energy as a whole, uh, lion, tiger, leopard, jaguar, all of those coming together as like big cat energy um, represented by the real um, physical ones. Those things are part of my practice. However, I do not consider myself to have a familiar because, well, I definitely don't work with any concept of demons as such. Some people do. I don't think of demons as the same way that a lot of people think of them. And we've talked about demons on this channel before too. Uh, so that's not something that I work with in that regard. But also, I just don't have, like even getting rid of the negative connotation part of it, I don't have any spirits who work with me who just happen to be in the form of an animal. Um, there are no spirits like that that I regularly work with, such as someone might talk about their spirit guide taking the form of an animal. And it should also be mentioned, some people's spirit guides are humanoid and familiars can also take human forms. So the fact that they are thought of as mostly animals might come from that European witch craze type history. Um, or it might just be that a lot of the time that that is how they appeared. You know, I don't know. I don't, I don't work with them. I don't have one. I don't think I ever really have had one. The only time that I've ever had a physical animal companion, a non-human animal member of my family who I have ever considered in the past to be a familiar. And even today, now that I have a slightly expanded and a different view. My hair is getting so frizzy because it's air drying right now. It's just gonna change all throughout this video. It's fine. Um, now that I have sort of an expanded awareness of what a familiar was and what it means to certain people versus the way that people very colloquially use it today as almost synonymous with family pet. There is still only one instance in my life where I would ever even say, okay, maybe I did have a familiar, and that uh, was my cat, Mystery, who I have a memorial video for from when she passed away on my personal channel. 
And the reason that I, even looking back now, would say maybe Mystery really was a familiar and she's the only one that I ever, like, thought was is because she's the only animal that really, like, randomly popped up in my life at a very, um, sort of threshold of my life and came out of nowhere, joined our family, and was always actually very interested in what I was doing. Of course, I didn't realize this at the time, but when she passed away six-ish years later, I had realized looking back, cause I was thinking like, well, when did she come into my life and what was going on in my life at the time? I realized that she had come into my life right when I was starting to practice and study witchcraft. And then when she died, I had come out to my mom as a witch. I was now openly talking about witchcraft and paganism and identifying as a witch online, on the internet, in public. So I really feel like she was present with me throughout that sort of beginning stages of my budding witchcraft, budding witch identity. And she was always very interested in what I was doing. And she would always like sleep on my altar and drink out of the altar bowl and like things like that, that my other family animal companions have never done those things. And also Mystery was just so smart and like she knew things that we never taught her like um and she was very independent I mean cats are very independent in general but she was very independent in that like she's the only cat I've ever had that would wait at the door to be let outside like the dogs you know it was just so it was like I fully believe that she could have been just the the animal cat form manifestation of a higher spirit who was there to guide me and help me and then left when I no longer needed her. Um, there has never been another animal in my life like that, although I have had many, many, many non-human animal family companions, family members um, that I've lived with over the years. And so I tend to think that the very modern colloquial usage of the term where people who identify as witches today say that any family pet is automatically their familiar, basically because they just think familiar means an animal that lives with a witch. Um, I think that that is an oversimplified definition that is not necessarily the case. However, sometimes animals that live with you could absolutely be familiars. And that's the next question, the next part of the question here uh, submitted by Revolution is how do you know if an animal companion is a familiar or is familiar material? And it's one of those things that I don't believe anyone else can really tell you, but there are many videos that people have made online about that subject. You can find various articles about it. So. I won't sit here and try to tell you. You just heard me describe why I think that one of my animals may have been. She really did have more of a guiding and protecting role in my life than others. And, you know, showed up out of nowhere, literally like walked over a hill through the woods. And like I was outside and she came to me through the woods and then lived with us for six years, you know. Um, and some people have described things like that as the way that familiar spirits have made themselves known to them. I would not say that the cat that I have now, who I went to the Humane Society and adopted, you know, and I chose her, I would not automatically assign her the role of like, okay, well, now you're my familiar because I said you are. I believe that familiar spirits or any type of spirit guides really typically come to you when you need them. And that's why, you know, everybody wants their animal guide to be something cool and powerful, like the wolf or the lion or the bear or whatever that particular person thinks is really cool, like a snake, you know, whatever. But sometimes you might do a meditation or a trance journey or something to find out who your animal guides are at that time in your life. And it might be like a gecko or it might be a mouse. 
Um, and sometimes people are disappointed by that, but I, I truly believe that it's like they choose us. We don't necessarily get to choose them. On the other hand, you absolutely can choose to reach out to different spirits, whether they be spirits of place, uh, when you move to a new place and you decide to go out and introduce yourself to the spirits that live on that land and the spirits of that place and say, I would like to form a relationship with you and you bring them offerings and give them gifts and things like that. You can absolutely choose animals, plants, you know, whatever that you would like to develop a relationship with and you can be the one really making the effort to make that relationship happen, of course. I think those are sort of two separate roles that those types of spirits have in our lives. And when we have talked about spirit guides and things like that before, I've also talked about how I think there's a difference between ones that kind of show up and are guiding us throughout our entire lifetime. And then I think there are ones that show up just as long as we need them and then go off to their next thing. And I believe there are some that might just be messengers for a very specific message, literally just a one-time thing and then they're gone. So I won't get into all of that again because again, I've talked about that in other videos before and I basically just gave you a mini, that was the Reader's Digest version of it. But yeah, so I don't consider those things the same as familiars. Before I end this, I suppose, we'll go over the, the other two encyclopedias that I didn't get out just now. So Rosemary Ellen Guiley, uh, one of these, these are both Rosemary Ellen Guiley encyclopedias. One of these is actually cited in the Patty Wigington article that I'm going to link below. I don't remember which one it is. I think it might be this one. This one has a much longer entry about familiars. This one just has a short entry about familiars that's basically summarizing what is said in this one. This is the Encyclopedia of Witches and Witchcraft. So it makes sense that familiars would have a much more in-depth entry in this one. And this one is the Encyclopedia of Magic and Alchemy, which of course familiars are still associated with other types of magicians and occult work um, and demonology and things like that that might be talked about in Magic and Alchemy, but less so than witches and witchcraft because familiars are really heavily associated with witches and witchcraft. So in this one, again, it's a long entry. I'm not going to read this all to you, but I'll skim through it really quick just to give you an idea of what Rosemary Ellen Guiley says. So starting out here, it's page 121. Familiars. Historically, low-ranking demons in constant attention to witches for the purpose of carrying out spells and bewitchments. Familiars usually assume animal forms. Cats, toads, owls, mice, and dogs were the most common, though virtually any animal or insect could be suspected. And is it is it also this entry that at the end... Yes, this entry goes on to talk about how cats, toads, owls, mice, dogs were the most common in Europe and perhaps also in the Americas. But if you look at witchcraft and similar practices, of course noting that not everyone identifies as a witch, but there are people all around the world in different cultures with different practices doing very similar things and just calling it something different. Um, looking at people all around the world who have similar concepts of these types of spirits and that they, the most common ones were entirely different animals depending on where you are in the world, which makes sense. So your your animal spirit would have been something very common for the area where you are. So for us today, you know, cats are very highly associated with witchcraft and especially um, in the areas where we live. In witchcraft trials, if so much as a fly buzzed in the window while a witch was being questioned or tried, it was said to be her familiar. You know, so this was like, you know, anything could have been a witch's familiar as far as the witch trials were concerned because of just the the craziness of the the fear, the fear surrounding it. That if someone was accused of being a witch and was sitting in jail and any type of insect started crawling toward them, people would freak out and think, oh, she, much have, she must have bewitched 
that creature and it's coming to help her to escape or to kill us all or whatever, you know. <laughs> so any number of things could have been called um, familiars. This entry goes on to say, familiars, also called imps, see the entry about imps, were said to be given to witches by the devil or bought or inherited from other witches. A witch could have several of them. Cats were the favored forms, especially black ones. The fear that all cats were witches familiars was one of the reasons for the cat massacres that swept through medieval Europe. So people were so afraid of witchcraft and witches and their familiars and the fact that any animal you came across could potentially be doing a witch's bidding that they just killed tons of cats, especially black ones. So, and I'm sure people thought the same thing about the rats with the plague, you know, any number of things. Uh, witches were said to take great care of their familiars. Um, you know, so they'll talk about uh, the different ways that witches feed their familiars and all kinds of things. And then, yeah, just a shorter summary in this other one. Actually, before I end this, <laughs> I know um, we're doing another half hour video here on Pagan Perspective. Before I end this, I did want to talk about um, some pop culture, like media examples of these types of things. And I would love to hear your examples of stuff that you know of. So in the Wikipedia article, it lists some popular culture media representations or examples of familiars. Some of the ones it mentions are in Charmed. The Hollowell sisters have a cat named Kit who is spoken of as their familiar. I think in the way that I think of familiars as the um, a spirit who takes the form of an animal who is there to guide and help and protect and things like that and who also may choose to take part in the witch's workings. Like to me, I said, I don't have a familiar. I don't like the, the old school, you know, witch craze fear form um, where people thought that witches were just uh, having spirits in the form of animals do their bidding. I don't do any of that. Um, and so I would also say that like, even though I believe all non-human animals are attracted to the work that we do and are very cognizant of energy patterns and can feel energy more strongly than we can. Children also are the same way. They can see spirits, they can sense things um, much better than the rest of us, even those of us who work at it. There's some of it that kind of gets taken away by society telling us that it's ridiculous as we grow up and then we find witchcraft later and we're like, oh, I have to reteach myself all the things that I knew as a kid. Um, so I believe that non-human animals have that as well. So I believe any simple family pet, if you will, um, may still be really attracted to wanting to sit with you while you're casting circle or meditating or reading tarot cards or oracle cards or whatever. I believe that any animal, even if they are not a familiar, is still attracted to those things. But the big difference for me would be whether they choose to loan you some of their energy when you're doing something. Like, if my cat walks into my circle while I'm casting, I just let her be there and do whatever. And if she's lending her own energy, cool. If not, cool, whatever. She's just there, she's witnessing. I personally do not, if she walks into the circle, take that as, oh, she's deciding to be my familiar and lend me her power. I do not energetically reach out to her and take her energy and use that as part of my cone of power or anything like that. I personally do not think that there is a way to really obtain consent from them to do something like that the way that you could with human beings choosing to be in your circle and lending you their energy. Um, so if they're present, in my circle, I just take it as knowing that all non-human animals are just very aware of that type of energy and it feels good. And if you're doing something positive and energetic, 
they're going to be attracted to that. You know, that doesn't necessarily make them a familiar in my mind. So, you know, I said I would leave that up to you and you can go watch all those other videos on how to tell if your animal is a familiar or not. But that's, that's one thing for me that it doesn't necessarily mean they are a familiar. But anyway, so with Kit in Charmed, I think that we could consider Kit that type of familiar of how I think of them because she does play a role in bringing the sisters together. You know, when Paige comes into the picture, we find out that when Kit has been going off for periods of time and the sisters don't know where she is, that she's actually been visiting Paige, who was another member of the family that they didn't know. And so Kit kind of helped bring them together. And Kit also does help them in certain episodes. She helps protect them. She helps warn them of things. Um, so I think Kit is a good example of a familiar. The Wikipedia art article also mentions that um, in The Chilling Adventures of Sabrina, the new Netflix Sabrina series, that Sabrina has a familiar who is a goblin who takes the form of an animal. So I think that's a great example. I also had thought about the original Sabrina, the animated series, talking about Salem because Salem is a warlock, specifically, uh, not meaning a male witch, but meaning a witch who betrayed the council. And so he, the uh, sort of original definition of an oath breaker, he betrayed the council um, and went against, you know, broke the rules, essentially. And he is being punished by being put in the form of a cat. Um, so he's not just some like disembodied spirit taking the form of a cat, but he is another being, another entity, a humanoid being, a witch, who is being punished by being put in the form of a cat. And he is sort of acting in the role that a familiar might act where he helps Sabrina learn things. He often gets her into trouble, but that's just because of who he is as a person. Um, but he, he's a little bit of a guiding role. So he's kind of like borderline familiar representation. I also love Practical Magic. So I think this is a good example. In the movie Practical Magic, you see cats a few different times. And there's like one specific time where there's a close-up of Jillian holding a cat and cuddling it. But you really don't see the cat's do anything or interact with the family in any other way other than just being family members, right? They just live there. They just happen to be cats who live with witches. But they're not doing anything actively to guide them, protect them. They don't have a role in the magic at all. On the other hand, the toads in Practical Magic, I would say, are an example of something that might be like a familiar because they are clearly like manifestations of some other type of energy that is coming in to deliver a message or in the one case to deliver a physical object which has a very strong message for the girls um and then later all of the toads manifesting around Jillian because of the spirit that is inhabiting Jillian sort of creating just manifestations of toads everywhere. Um, so I think that those are kind of a more apt example. And that's a good example of how like witches might own cats who aren't familiars. Um, there are other examples in the Wikipedia article. Like I talked about the movie, The Witch has a familiar who takes the shape of a goat. And that, it doesn't say it in the Wikipedia article, but if you've seen the movie The Witch, that would be Black Phillip. Talking about Black Phillip as a familiar because Black Phillip is an animal who contains another spirit or entity. So yeah, th those are the distinctions that I make. Um, we have covered familiars before on this channel, but if I did a video about it six years ago or even nine years ago or whatever, I probably had different views on it then. So this is the most updated version. It's 2019, it's April 2019 right now. Um, so anything that I may have said about familiars previously, 
maybe doesn't apply anymore. Um, I do not have a familiar. That is what it means to me. And um, yeah, there, there are many videos you can look up to see many different people's ideas and opinions and personal beliefs on how you can tell if an animal is really a familiar or not. And yeah, I would just keep it in mind that a lot of people use the term in a very colloquial sense that's almost synonymous with family pet or just a pet who, uh, an animal who lives with you. Um, I do not believe that an animal is automatically a familiar just by living with someone who practices witchcraft. I believe that they have a much different role. Um, and I was going to talk about the other thing, which is the role of the of our pets, if any, in our practice. Um, so I kind of did touch on that. If they show up, cool. If not, cool. Um, I do protect my animal family members magically. They are part of my family, um, but I do not use them to do any other types of spells. I do not draw on their energy for any types of spells. I do, however, Sometimes when I really need a grounding influence and I'm having a bad day or whatever, I will invite them into my lap um, to help me ground because they are very earthy energy and very connected um, to that energy. And so I will sit with them and commune with them in order to ground myself. But that is really the only time when my non-human animal companions have a very specific role in my practice. So thank you very much for watching. If you watched the whole video, you'd a real MVP. And I will see you next month because next week is subs week. Let us know your thoughts about familiars and related topics in the comments. If you have any other good resources for people on the subject, feel free to share them. Although remember that if you post a link in the comments, it might get marked as spam and we might not see that in a reasonable amount of time to approve your comments. So try to just tell people the name of the website without a link or tell them what to search or something like that to ensure that your comments will not be lost and um, postponed, if you will. Thank you very much for watching. I will see you next time. Until then, don't forget to be awesome. Blessed be. And goodbye.